Welcome to our detailed, spoiler-free review of The Forest of No Return. Thanks, Ulysses Spiel, for sending us a copy of this expansion to check out. The Adventure Adventure card game was designed by Michael Palm and Lucas Zack. Now, the adventures in this expansion for Aventuria were written by Christian Lonsing, Michael Mingers, and Marcus Plotz. While I would love to credit all the artists that work on this project, there are 22 of them, and that would take far too long, but I do appreciate the work that went into it. Now, the English version of this expansion was published by Ulysses Spiel back in 2016. Now, this was the first expansion for the Adventure Adventure card game, which is required for you to use the contents of this box. This is not a standalone expansion. It has an MSRP of $29.99 US and is designed to be played by one to five players. For more information on the Aventuria base set, as well as the various other expansions we've seen so far, check out our reviews on the blog, YouTube, and the podcast. So the Forest of No Return contains a new character. Hilbert from Awen, a blessed one of Parine, a druid-like hero, as well as three adventures. Now, two of these are short one-act adventures, and the last is a longer three-act adventure. Each of these adventures is a standalone experience, but of course, you're welcome to use the same group of heroes for each of them. As usual, there are four difficulties presented for each story, adding to the replayability of this box set. Well, for a look at the components you get in this box, making sure not to spoil the story at all, check out our Forest of No Return unboxing video on YouTube. So in this box, you'll find a hero deck, a hero counter, a life wheel, and a liturgical chant counter for Hilbert. That's the new character. You also get a number of tokens, including one new fate point, grabbed counters, body control counters, and additional doom time counters. Cards for each of the three adventures, 22 new henchman cards, four new reward cards, and a selection of event and leader action cards. Now the card quality here matches everything else out for adventure and everything else we own which is good and what you want from a collectible or sorry not collectible from a a deck building card game but the tokens and life wheels are actually quite different they have a glossy coating that really sticks out when compared to the stuff i already own now additionally the life wheel is actually constructed differently from the ones you get in the wheel of life expansion this one's like snapped together and doesn't screw apart so once you put it together it's it's stuck forever that said, none of that matters. Like none of this matters as far as gameplay is concerned. The gloss kind of sticks out on the table, but it doesn't impact your play. So it is notable though, that of all the boxes that we've received and opened, there is a range of different and mismatched components. Mm -hmm. Again, not in any way that impacts the game, but it feels a bit thrown together when some characters have wheels, some characters have cards, some have tokens and some don't, mm -hmm. as well as some having gender swap versions while others don't. So all of this is due to the fact that there were two printings of the game, basically two editions of Aventuria. It came out originally, I don't know the exact year, and all of the heroes had wheels. And I don't know on the adventure counters at all. They were also all glossy components. So for tracking health, everyone had a wheel and it was snapped together. Well, when they decided to reprint the game, and as far as I know, this is also some, something tied with a Kickstarter to bring it to North America and localizing. Again, I don't have the full details on this, but when they went to remake the game, it ends up they could no longer get the plastic clips that they used to make the wheels. So instead, they decided to switch to a card-based, which is like Euchre, where you have one card with numbers 1 to 10 on it, another card you turn that says 0 to 40. So that's the reason that one changed, but I have no idea why sometimes you get an adventure token and sometimes you don't, when those are actually, in a way, integral to play, because you're supposed to put them somewhere and randomize them and then figure out, uh, like I use a bag, and I randomize my bag, pull them out to randomize characters. Now, the whole thing is you don't need that. When we're playing two-player, we just roll a die. Even it's you, odd it's me. Way quicker, it's easier than fiddling around. But it's odd that you do get some and sometimes you don't. I do find that interesting. Now, all of the gender-swapped versions is actually all from promo cards. That's not something that comes in any of the expansions. So there is a promo set with gender-swapped characters for this particular set, but there isn't, like, it's not like the included adventures to come with gender-swapped versions. So that makes sense. And again, I'm not sure how they chose which 
characters to do gender swaps for them, which they didn't. All right, well, now that you know what you get in the box, how about you walk through how you can use all this to improve your Aventuria games? All right, starting with the hero, the new hero, Hilbert Owen, the Blessed One of Perrine. So blessed ones are the holy people in the Dark Eye setting. They use what are something called liturgical chants instead of magic. They actually can't use magic. They use chants instead. Now, Hilbert is an experienced adventurer who realizes not everyone's as peaceful and calm as he is. He seeks to stand up for the weak and protect them from all danger. Now, he felt drawn to distant lands, sensing that people there were in greater need than the folk back in his home of Owen. One quote from him is, he who works a lot must also eat a lot, as his motto. Now, Brother Hilbert is what I would call a druid. He's not a D&D style priest, right? When you hear Blessed One of Perrine and he's a priest and he's a holy brother of, of the, the Perrine, I, I think like priest, D&D priest, but that is not what he is. He is much more druid. He includes a number of animal attacks, animal companions, spell casting things and liturgical chants, as well as cards that protect, heal, and buff. Many of his cards also affect the die rolls in play, both his and his opponents, and he features three attack types, which can turn him into quite the powerhouse later in a combat. Skill-wise, he's great at craft, good at persuade and survival, but not so great at the physical stuff like body control, perception, and stealth. Now, the liturgical chance is something brand new. It's a new type of card that features a new mechanic where you have to pay endurance for each card in play, each chant in play at the end of your turn, or else they go away. So you basically have to save up endurance for the end of your turn. Now, Hilbert's ability that you can use once per combat is to pick one chant in play and ignore that cost so it can just stay up permanently. So is it just me, but I'm getting a bit of a almost a Friar Tuck vibe from him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. I can totally see that. Though I got to say it's Friar Truck if he was a druid and can turn into a tiger. Well, I'd say, you know what, honestly, the, the, the Robin Hood friar is way more druid than okay. uh, D&D priest, I, uh, generally speaking, I would say. Fair um, enough. Maybe not turning into tigers. But <laughs> <laughs> the, the love of food and drink, definitely part of the character, is definitely, I, I would say, inspired in some ways. So that's the character. What about the adventures? So starting off the short adventures, you've got two short one-act adventures. First is called Head Money. It has your characters tracking down a murderer and stumbling into something much more sinister. Now, this is very much a horror adventure with some really strong depictions of gore, including mutilation and body horror. Now, the adventure features three tests and one combat, the difficulty of the combat, which is going to be modified by how well your group does on the tests. Which is, frankly, pretty standard fare for these adventures. Mm -hmm. I think... Overall, now we know that some body horror is to be expected in Adventuria's adventures now. Yeah, that's something we've noticed over time. The more adventures we play, the more the more we explore outside of the core box, you definitely do get a tone shift. But that's something I'll get into more when I'm sharing on my thoughts, instead of just covering what comes in the box. So next up, we have Selmian Delusions. This is another short adventure. It follows the exact same format. Three tests and a combat. No, the tests are completely different. The combat's completely different, but it's got that same format. Now, in this short adventure, you're trying to rescue a princess who has run away from her father and gotten involved in something unsavory. The adventure is also quite dark and includes even more adult-oriented content, including an orgy involving men, animals, and non-humans. So all of this is just mentioned in passing. This isn't in as much romance novel-like detail that we found in the Veil Dancer expansion that we, appear, we reviewed last week. Aventuria is certainly proving to be a darker setting, more akin to Warhammer or other mm. similar games that don't offer up a lot in the way of hopeful positivity in the world. Now, finally, is the much longer Forest of No Return adventure from which this box set gets its name. This is a full three-act adventure that includes 37 adventure cards. In this adventure, you're hired by King Casimir himself to recover a very valuable piece of parchment, his family tree, which is needed to prove his legitimacy and prevent civil war. Each act in the story follows the same format as the short adventures. You've got three checks followed by a combat, all linked together by the story. 
While this adventure is designed to be played in order one act at a time, you can also choose to play any one of the three acts as a standalone short adventure. Now, what's interesting here, tone-wise, is this adventure is not nearly as dark as the other two. This better matches the tone of the adventures in the core box. This is one I would have no problem playing with my kids. And I actually figured this may be something due to the fact that I've learned that the Adventuria stories are actually classic adventure modules that are being brought back to life. Classic, the Dark Eye RPG adventure modules being brought back to life. And I have, I, I, I may be completely off track here, but I have a feeling The Forest of No Return was like a classic 70s, 80s old school module where the two short stories were written much more modern. Certainly makes sense. So this is probably the most content you've gotten adventure-wise from any box since the base set, yes? Yeah, definitely. Um, though it is a bit odd because we're going out of order, right? So technically, this was the first expansion ever published for Adventuria. It's not the first I played. We opened some hero sets and we tried some other stuff first. It has just as many adventures as the core box, two short, one long. But these are all more involved and deeper than the core box. So the short adventures of the core box have one check and a combat. And there's not much story there. They're one page, boom, make a check, boom, have a combat. Whereas there is a lot more checks and things that are affected before each combat in this. So I would say for co-op adventures, you are getting more content than the base game in this box. All right. Well, they're certainly giving you your money's worth. So as long as the type of content isn't of concern. Yeah. So. In these two adventures, the main Forest of No Return and Sell Me in Delusions, they do introduce a new mechanic to Adventuria that I got to say is welcome. Uh, this is the environment cards. There are four of these in the set, and they're specific to the included adventures. So it's not like the henchmen or the events where you're going to shuffle them in with the rest of your cards. These only work for these adventures. Now, each of these is placed in play at the start of the combat and add additional rules into play. And I don't want to spoil what they do, but they are definitely interesting. Now, the main game rules contains a way to play through a random combat, like a, like a wandering monster fight. And I would be very tempted to grab these, shuffle them up, and throw one into play to make that more interesting. Because I can't see mixing them these into a different adventure. I can't see doing like the, um, the t Master Taylor's Poltergeist and throwing one of these into play. It just wouldn't work. But I would love to see these used in more things. And I'm wondering if future content may call back these, though they are specifically labeled for each individual story. Indeed. While not exactly missed, the location of the fight was, until now, never anything other than some color text in the yes. lead-up documentation. And despite being called environments, it's not always just about the place, is all I will say. Now, I mentioned above, but it's also worth noting that each of these adventures provides four different time cards and can be played at four different le difficulty levels from easy to legendary. This, combined with the fact you can play each of the big adventures separately at different difficulty levels, adds quite a bit of replayability to these cooperative adventures. So as we mentioned, with all adventure content, there is no which way. You are going to get the same linear story every time. So certainly no shortage of replayability with the same or different groups. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, now that we know what you get and how you use it, what are your thoughts on this, the first Aventuria expansion? So let's start with the biggest shock to us when sitting down to play through these new adventures, and that is the tone of the stories. This is a tone we didn't really see in the core set. The short adventures in Forest of No Return are very much grim, dark fantasy, bordering on horror. These stories are gruesome and dark and involve what I would call R-rated content. There's gore, body horror, eroticism, bestiality, and more. And as I mentioned before, this was perhaps hinted that the game could go this way Maybe. in the base set. But I think if you got the base set and played it with your family, you might be shocked if you yeah. wanted to keep playing it with your family, moving on to these new adventures. So again, I did mention it earlier, the three-act story, I think you'd have no problem with. Uh, there is someone who has been tortured, and it just says the tortured person gives you this information, as opposed to more like the other adventures where it would describe the state of the tortured person. Here it's all glossed over in like any fantasy story. If you've read a fantasy novel, Dragonlance, like I would put this at the, the high fantasy feel versus the grim dark. But the short adventures are definitely something else. Now, what I do want to say is I don't think this is a bad thing. 
not at all. I have no problem with Grimdark. I am a huge fan of Warhammer. I've been for years, but I think anyone considering picking up this box set to be aware of this darker tone in the two stories, because this was a surprise to us, because the stories in the Adventure Core set were almost whimsical, like especially the Master Taylor's Poltergeist was pure whimsy. Then another one where you're guessing a goblin's name. Yes, the big adventure did have vampires and got a little darker and there was some demon summoning, but it was never described in detail. Well, there was some violence in the full adventure, it was nothing compared to what we saw in the short adventures in Forest of No Return. Now, now that we played this and some other adventure adventures, I now know what to expect. So again, it's something we mentioned many times on the show, setting expectations is some of the most important things you can do at game night. Knowing what you're getting into is important here. Now that I know what to get into, I now know that Deanna and I need to pre-play any stories before we decide to share them with the kids. Now, forgetting about this tone change, I got to say straight up, I really enjoyed this adventure expansion for Adventure. Well, it is a bit strange that the component quality doesn't match up on some of the bits. Again, that doesn't matter for play at all. So to me, that's a, that's a no problem. I personally appreciate having a wheel to track held over cards. Though, oddly, if you get the Wheel of Life expansion, which we've already reviewed and looked at, you'll now have two wheels for Hilbert, one that's glossy, one that's not. The one in Wheel of Life is also flippable to the gender-swapped version, which is Gertrude Swordplower, Blessed One of Perrain. Now, the cards for that female-presenting version actually has a totally different set of skills, which is interesting, but you'll have to find that in the Ship of Stone promo pack, not in this box set. Again. The components you use as a player, not the cards, all the accessories are a bit of a frustration, even though they have actually little impact or no impact on the actual game yeah. play. Now, looking at Hilbert, the new character, I have played him through one of the short adventures as well as the three act adventure, which took us more than three tries. And I really enjoyed playing him. Yet again, we have another hero that manages to feel and play very differently from every other hero we play. I love that about this game so far. Now I found Hilbert to be very fragile. Um, he only has one armor card in his entire deck and lots of cards for debuffing his opponents and improving his meager attack stats. He starts off with some low stats. You're looking at less than 50% chance to hit with most of your attacks. Well, his liturgical chants are powerful, the fact you basically have to burn one endurance every turn can make them very costly, especially in combats where you need to make tests as well as attacks. So if you're in a combat where you have to spend two endurance to make a test, what's more important having that spell up or making that test to be able to affect the lieutenant? Now, once you do get some cards into play, though, Hilbert can be powerful. He features all three attack types, melee, ranged, and magic, doing more than D6 damage for all of them including one whopping liturgical chant, Animal Shape, that features an attack that gives you plus two to hit and does 2d6 plus two damage, only at the cost of five to put into play. Hmm. Now, all of this, though, relies on keeping him alive until he can get that card into play, which is not easy with a low dodge of five and very few defense cards. In the first chapter of Forest No Return, I got down to four hit points by turn five. Now, overall, I think I still prefer Arbosh, the Dwarf's Blacksmith. I don't know what my attraction is, to, attraction is to that character, maybe because he was the first I played. I did enjoy playing Hilbert and would happily play him again. And even if it's not to your taste, the fact that they found yet another mechanic and style of play to incorporate as an mm -hmm. option is just great. You just might want to have a healer on hand. Yes. Now, as for the adventures, we played through Head Money with just Deanna and I, and after getting over the initial shock of the gory descriptions in the story, we, and learning we can never play this with our kids, we did have a good time with this adventure. The fact these short adventures featuring three checks instead of just one is a nice change from the, the core game short adventure, and made it feel more like a story, and it made it feel like those checks mattered a lot more than, ooh, you start with a fate point, or ooh, you draw an extra card. There was a lot more involved in this. It also featured a neat mechanic where how you did on those checks made a direct impact on how many henchmen you had to face in the final battle. This is a nice touch. And that's one thing about Aventuria that's often been missing from this sort of game is actual impact moving forwards mm. from the non-combat aspects. Yes. 
So next we played for Selmian Delusions. This was with five players, including Sean here, as well as Tori and Kat. Now the combat in this adventure was interesting as it had a new twist that made the start of the combat even harder than any other fight we have fought. Now, part of this involved a new environmental card mechanic, as well as the player actions that were in play, and there were multiples. Now, I don't want to spoil anything here. This one is definitely interesting, and I, I really appreciate the work that goes into making each Adventuria combat unique. Again, th this, like every other time I've played the game, was just straight up an enjoyable experience with a bit of game stress, but not <laughs> too much that it overwhelmed just having fun at the table with it with your group now finally deanna and i went through the full forest of no return story now one thing that really amused me about this is the other two adventures are set in the forest and the forest seems like this brutal difficult spooky place with all these terrible things happening well the forest itself doesn't play much of a role here uh your first combat actually happens once you're through the forest so i almost recommend if you are going to play through this just to get the story impact of how scary this place is to play through the short adventures first, just so you can realize how deadly the forest is. And it just, that way when you're like, wow, we made it through the forest, now what's gonna happen? Now the new environment cards are used to full effect in this adventure. Um, this is a three act adventure that uses the new event deck and it uses the leader action deck. So sorry, they're not the new event deck and the leader action. It uses the event deck, which will have new cards in it and the leader action deck that will have new cards in it. Now, one other mechanic I liked during this was that the skill checks, in addition to having a mix of you pick who makes the check, so you're going to pick whoever has the highest stat, and everyone makes the check, there were actually a few where the entire group rolls, but it, there were additional results. So if everyone failed the test, you all just have to try again. Or if everyone failed, this is going to happen. Or if one person fails, but everyone else succeeds, that's going to impact the combat. And I thought that was really neat. It actually reminded me of skill challenges in 4th Ed D&D. The way you're kind of getting checks and Xs and depending on how many people pass actually made an impact instead of everyone who passes gets a fate and everyone who fails loses a fate or draws a card or something. Yet another variance from what they could have easily gotten away with as bare minimum effort. They really aren't just phoning in these adventures with a fresh plot slapped on to a default progress system. Oh, I agree. And for the fact, like, yes, it's kind of rote. Every adventure is three checks, then a fight. And you kind of get that feel. Those checks are so different and their impacts are so different. And to be honest, I should have been saying three checks, but like it might be a check, but you may have to redo a couple of them. So it could be more than three. Now, as for the Forest No Return, the story was excellent. Um, again, as I mentioned, this was much more family friendly than the two short adventures. The combats were particularly challenging. Um, in one act, we we're both down to under 10 hit points by the fifth round. And after sneaking in a victory, we then totally failed the next act completely. Which leads me to something I don't think we've actually mentioned in our previous Adventuria content, losing an adventure. So when you lose an adventure, you stop. You're just done. You lose any reward cards you've earned, and you reset your decks back to base. Then it's just done. You're, you finished. It doesn't matter what act you're on. If it was the end of act one, you're done at the end of act one. End of Act 2, you're done at the end of Act 2. End of Act 3, you're just done. You can then try again, but you're starting back at Act 1 with a new set of characters or perhaps the same characters, but reset to, to zero level, like reset to everything. Of course, keeping any previous experience earned in other stories, because that's the whole adventure you think. Now, even the story is written that you fail, but another group came in after you and completed what you started, which I thought was somewhat encouraging. Like I read it and like, we're going to be that next group. Now, the important part to note here is that if you fail a specific act, you don't, by the book, get to retry just that act. You've got to start entirely over, which thematically makes sense. But which I can see could be frustrating to some people, but really make, just makes for more gameplay in the long run. Mm -hmm. And isn't that what we're here for? Now, we, of course, learned this through experience, which led to another interesting observation of how different the exact same adventure can be due to the random nature of the cards and the dice. This is a draw cards from a deck game, shuffle the decks, and roll a lot of dice. For the act we failed, our second attempt was almost a cakewalk. It went extremely well. We could have finished with three time left with neither of us ever knocked out or even under 10 health if the dice had been just a little bit happier, just a little bit, one more crit probably, and we could have finished it with three time left. Now, the big change, of course, were which events came up 
there is one combination of a new event and a specific lieutenant that is devastating if it happens. The odds of this are pretty slow. There's there's only one of those events in the 10 cards. Um, so that was big. The henchmen we had out made a big difference and possibly even more so what we rolled for the enemy to do. I, again, I'm, I'm being as vague as possible because I really don't want to spoil it. Um, if I mention what was happening, it, it really does kind of ruin this. But there were certain results on the enemy card that seemed a little un unbalanced isn't the right word, but you don't want them to come up. In that first fight, they came up often. It's, it's wonderful because the variety of henchmen, for instance, increases with every new yes. set you add. So you are if you buy a new game, then come back and try Forest again, it might be a whole yes. different adventure all again with things you've never seen in the game that in that adventure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Now that said, the adventures we did win followed the typical adventure a roller coaster. Um, I would almost call it like the, like the um uh, the loop of the play loop you get from a game of Adventuria because we've now played in multiple games, I think over 10 different adventures I've completed now. You definitely got the what the heck? How are we gonna win this? We've got no chance. Look at this enemy, look at that, and I have no cards, and what am I gonna do? Two, two, three rounds in, we're like, oh my god, we're almost dead, we're doomed. There's no way we're gonna make that. To wait, wait, I've got some defense now. I'm starting to do more. We might just have that to ah, we crush that. That was fantastic. You see how much damage I did that last turn? We definitely seem tend to see that curve, except in the one where we got utterly destroyed. Yeah, and it's it's this curve balance of increasing hero ability with the converse villain weakening yeah. has just been so well done in these adventures. Yeah, every game feels tense and stressful. Now, some of the other small bits I didn't get to mention yet just because they didn't really fit in was the new reward cards are welcome. Um, they're, this is a forest. The, the henchmen tend to be animal specific. And while you get some rewards that particularly work rather well in this adventure if you're lucky enough and then come up getting to that random factor again um the large number of new animal keyword henchmen you get in this is significant i have not verified it but i think all 22 of the new henchmen are animals of some type now there are forest animals there are underground animals there are undersea animals but they're all animals you also get a new henchman type which is called swarms now, Swarms is another new mechanic added in this game, though I have seen them in other expansions as well, but they were introduced in this. Again, we kind of played things out of order. Now, Swarms tend to have low hit points, but you put three counters on them, representing the size of the Swarm. When you reduce a Swarm to zero hit points, instead of killing it and removing it from the game and getting a Fate Point, you instead just remove a counter. Now, the big thing about Swarms are is it might only have three hit points, well, any additional damage is lost. So you pull out your giant, I turned into a tiger attack with Orin, or sorry, with uh, Hilbert, and you do 2d6 plus 2 damage and pull out a big 14 points of damage, well, you only kill one rat. You only remove one token. Now, the swarm is killed when the last counter is removed. Now, these rewards and henchmen, along with the new event and leader cards, are all great additions to your growing Aventuria collection. These are all cards I would welcome randomly showing up in future games. As Sean mentioned earlier, every expansion set adds to it, which is another part of the expansion I liked. The fact that this was not standalone, this merged with everything else we owned. So when setting up various combats in these adventures, we often saw a mix of old and new cards. So while one fight might have animals, it might also say have guards. So you're gonna mash up all your guards and all your animals. Unlike say in the Veil Dancer Hero Pack, where the included adventure made sure you only saw the new hirelings. This one gets mixed in. It presents new things along with the old, which I gotta say, it's an abstract card game, but it made the Dark Eye world feel more real and more alive. We have constantly applauded the meat that you get in these games that really improve what you have to work with with every single box you open. Now, one final note that I haven't touched on Having a new hero also means you get a lot more cards, 30 new cards to customize your existing heroes. And if only playing with four heroes, you now have one spare deck you can cannibalize to improve your other heroes. Because we talked about that before, where there is a deck building, sorry, deck construction mechanic done before you play. While getting Hilbert, you have many new cards, including the invocations and new abilities for him, but he also has many copies of some of the more popular cards specifically cards that buff all three of the different attack types. Those are cards I can easily see, like stealing for our Bosch, getting an extra copy of a, um, a 
I can't remember the card that gives you plus three to your uh, melee attacks, but I would totally see you stealing that card and throwing it in. We know you deck constructors love your options. So overall, there's a lot to like in Forest of No Return for Adventuria, and I have very few complaints. Sure, some of the non-mechanical components of the game have different finish, but it doesn't impact anything. My only real concern is making sure your group is aware of the nature of the two short adventures and the content they contain. This isn't high fantasy. This is grim, dark fantasy with tones and themes to match. Interestingly, though, the main three-act adventure does avoid these potential pitfalls, and I would say goes far enough to be family-friendly. The new character, Hilbert of Iwan, is an excellent hero and lots of fun to play and manages to feel very different from every other hero we own. The included adventures are well-written and engaging, and we've been continually impressed by what the writers have done with Adventuria to make each combat unique and interesting. And Forest No Return continues to bring more of the same. Honestly, if you own Adventuria and enjoy the cooperative adventure mode, you should just pick up a copy of Forest No Return. The new hero's great, the new adventures are even more involved and engaging than those in the base set. With this box, you're actually getting more story than you did in the original, and you're getting a new hero to play through them with. Added to that, you're getting new events, leaders, and henchmen cards that can make the initial adventures more interesting and variable, adding to the replayability of the base box. Heck, even if you choose not to play the two mini adventures to avoid problematic content, you're still mm -hmm. ahead picking up this for everything else it contains. Now where I'm on the fence is whether or not players who play Adventuria in dual mode would want this set. While we have heard that that's not the most popular way to play the game, I'm sure there's people out there that love the one-on-one -on -one combat or group mass melees. For the cost, you're going to get a lot of cards you won't be able to use, right? All the adventure stuff is wasted. What you do, though, get is a new, very solid hero worth using on their own, worth customizing, or just worth cannibalizing to make your current heroes better. Now, for those of you still listening who haven't played Adventuria, what are you waiting for? This continues to be our favorite adventure card game published to date. And again, I have to thank Ulysses Spiel for introducing us to the Adventuria game world and my first glimpse at the Dark Eye. Well, that's it for our review of Forest of No Return from the Adventuria Adventure Card Game. I invite you to also check out Mo's written review of this game over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com.